Games. Games. Hi, and welcome to Table by Teresa. Let's take a look at Warband Against the Darkness, which I'm going to call Warband from here on out, but don't confuse it with this, because it's also called Warband. Riveting. In Warband, you represent one of ten races, all of whom live in the five realms. You don't like each other very much, but you have a common enemy in the Hordes of Darkness. This is going to be brutal. Really, it's not like that. At all. You don't even see the Hordes of Darkness. Just their weapons. You put the board on the table and the round tracker on the appropriate spot. Eight for two players, seven for three, six for four, and five for five. Put one mercenary captain and two unit cubes in the light platoons. My husband likes to call the mercenaries humans. This game is morbid. It's not. It's really not. Remove the starting three enemy cards, which conveniently have a green background. Then shuffle the enemy, intel, and redress cards and put them near the board. I should mention that you should decide whether you want the mean redress deck, the nice one, or a combination. Then take the three starting enemy cards and place them at random at Threl's Gap, Guardians of Vethera, and Lone Spire Peak. What about the branches? It doesn't get one. Each player picks one of the ten races. You can do it randomly if you want. Each one has a special ability. Players take their colors board and put cubes on all of the columns except the left one. They also get seven captains and eight more unit cubes and three coins. The starting player puts a scout in Cauldrum. The next one puts one in Shinaru and the third in Elevethra. A fourth player would put a scout in Lorendale followed by Joni. Each round, the player whose turn it is has to decide what to upgrade. They remove the leftmost cube over the action they want to improve and put it in their reserve. It's now a unit. Taxing lets players get coins. Upgrading gets you more coins on a tax action, which you'll need to pay off the captains when you want to battle. Bribery. Intriguing. Training lets players put units on the board. Upgrading lets you put more at one time. Scouts give players points for the intel cards they have of a particular region at the end of a game. They also protect units in battle. By upgrading, you can place more scouts for fewer coins. Fight lets players battle. Upgrading lets you pay off more captains and have fewer units in battle. Actually, it lets you pay off fewer captains. Each turn, players get three actions. They can take them in any combination and order. The actions are available on your player board and the level at which you can do them is based on what's uncovered. The Minotaur decides to tax, gaining two coins. The Minotaur has upgraded the training action so he can place two troops instead of one. He can place two troops in any of the light platoons. That's the lowest area on the board. He can put them in the same area or two different areas. Or he could place one cube in a lower region, then pay one coin to move it up to a higher level. That helps protect it from casualties and gives him a captaincy since the majority player in any section becomes captain. He could have paid five coins to send one scout to any region, but he doesn't have enough now. So he'll see if he can fight, which deserves a section of its own since it takes 10 steps. Can we just quit now? No. It takes a bit, but you get used to it. One of the interesting things about Warband is that we always have to have enough troops to go against all the enemies, not just the one we're fighting. So we look at the number on each enemy card. That tells us how many troops we need in each platoon. Then we look at the section where we need troops. So to fight the enemy in Thrall's Gap, we need two units in the cavalry. We check the Warband roster. The mercenaries have us covered. We need two troops in the infantry for the Guardians of Vethera. 
we have more than enough between the mercenaries and the Minotaur. And the mercenaries have us covered for the archers needed at Lone Spire Peak. On, on to step two. That was only step one. Yes, it will be okay. We have to pay one gold to each captain on the board. We don't pay ourselves, so we owe three coins. If other players had captains, we would pay them, but since the only other captains are mercenaries, we pay the bank. If we had upgraded, we could have paid one less captain. Now the Minotaurs choose which enemy they want to defeat, take the card, and put it face down. The Minotaurs take the top two intel cards. They return one of the cards. Since they already have a scout and cauldron, they'll keep that card. And put it face down so the other players don't know what they have. It's time to send troops to Medica. Injuries. Ugh. On a two point card, no troops go to Medica. On a three point card, one troop goes. And on a four point card, two troops go. This is one place scouts come in. Each scout in a region adjacent to the enemy can save one troop from Medica. Anytime on their turn, a player can pay two coins to get a troop out of Medica, but any left there at the end of the game cost a player two victory points each. And now we assign casualties. Didn't we just do that? No, that was injuries. This is deaths. How disturbing. There's a six level hierarchy to assigning casualties, but we don't need to worry about that right now. It's enough to know we start at the bottom of the roster and move up. The enemy card shows which platoon will take casualties. There will always be two. So we check the corresponding pl light platoon. The mercenaries are the captains here, so they can't save their troops with gold the way other captains can, provided they have scouts in an adjacent region. Casualties are always assigned to the captain's race. So his troops are removed. He no longer has the majority, so he isn't captain. Any players who lost troops would draw one redress card. These cards can be used later in the game. Now it's time to salute the war heroes. For now, no one has troops in the honor guard space. But let's imagine that they did. The captain would choose one unit to go to the war heroes space. War heroes are worth two points at the end of the game. The captaincy may change after this step. Now we get to raid and pillage. This game is vulgar. We put one coin on each remaining enemy card. That's it. Yes. Players who defeat enemies with coins get to keep the coins too. We're at the final stage of the fight action. That's a small relief. We draw a new enemy card and place it in the space that was empty at the beginning of the turn. And now it's time to see what happens at the end. After the final player's last turn, it's time to add up points. So here's our ending situation. We'll just count up the Minotaurs with this handy score sheet. We have four enemy cards worth 12 points. Now we check to see if we have any war heroes. We have two war heroes for four points. Now to check on our captains. We have three captains worth one each. Our war heroes and scouts on the board can each convert three gold to one point. So we get one point for that. The only region where our scouts have the majority is Cauldron. So we get four points there. We multiply the number of scouts in a region by the number of intel cards we have for that region. We have five cards. We don't have any scouts in Elevathra. We have two Cauldron cards and four scouts there for eight points. We have two Shinaru cards and one scout for two points. We have one scout in Lorendale, but no Lorendale cards, and two in Joni, but no Joni cards, for a total of 10. Now we check to see if we have any units in Medica. We have one unit in Medica, 
so we subtract 2 for a total of 32, which is pretty high, but this is just an example. You couldn't make it realistic, could you? I wanted to show everything. Anyway, the player with the most points wins. Warband Against the Darkness has some major strengths, besides the Rockmen. As a matter of fact, this is a solidly designed game that feels more Euro than epic fantasy. You push cubes, build your engine, and collect victory points. But it's really a game about the economics and decision making involved in battle. There's also a sense of having to deal with bureaucracy. And oddly enough, that's interesting since it's not real life. Your choices often help your opponents, and there's more interaction than a typical Euro game because every player is involved on every turn. Still, there's no direct conflict. The battle system, despite its 10 steps, is quick once you get it down. It's also original. It works well at all of the player counts. And I especially appreciated that it's good with two. The character art is very good. And it's not bloody, which is nice, especially since this is rated for age 10. It seems a bit ambitious for a 10 year old, but it also seems appealing to the younger crowd. Parents, even squeamish ones like me, will likely be okay with it since the fighting doesn't feel very dark. You don't even see the enemy, although the Rodentia and the Giants are a bit creepy. It's easy to teach, though it's not so easy to learn from the rulebook, and the length of the game seems just right. The rulebook also gives you this handy strategy guide if you want to help, help getting started. I like that it's all together instead of spread throughout the rules. It's easier to avoid if you don't want to read it. And this note from the founder of Discami Publishing might make you cry. There's one major issue with Warband. It's called Warband. No. Well, yes. Kind of. Look at this cover. It looks epic. It holds promises of adventure and bloody battles to the death. In that sense, it doesn't deliver. It is, and I mean this with the greatest respect, not epic. The rulebook is a bit confusing here and there, so you'll need a bit of patience when you tackle it. It can also make people who play slowly tend to overanalyze. So what do I think? We're not going to stop you from telling us, are we? No, because I have some serious love for this game. Despite the war theme, it never seems brutal, but the choices are hard. What's good about that is that there are always good choices. You're just trying to find the best one. You're continually trying to push your opponents out of powerful positions and better your own, but you all have to work together a bit. That makes for subtle tension and a remarkable experience. This game is easily one of my favorites that came out at Gen Con. It didn't make as big a splash as some other games, but I am happy to have it on my shelf. Just a warning, I got a review copy of, Dis of Warband from Discami Publishing. That doesn't affect my ability to give an objective review. I'm not convinced. You hate war. True enough, but I love this game. If you'd like to check out other people's reviews of Warband Against the Darkness and find a few extra thoughts, come visit Table by Teresa. And here's all the stuff you don't really need to know. Thanks for watching.